Hello and welcome back to the Beefy Tech channel. Don't I have a fun RAM video for you today? Because everybody knows the 7800X3D and 7950X3D alike work best when they're one to one with 6000 to 6400 MHz RAM memory. And well, here I am running DDR5 7800, albeit, mind you, it is decoupled, so it's not running one to one, quote unquote. It's running 3900, 2133, 1950. So, fully decoupled in that sense, but it is DDR5-7800 on the AM5 platform, and not only that, it does tend to actually work fairly well with gaming too. And that's kind of the point of today's video, to show you guys what you could expect in terms of performance when you compare DDR5-6400 on the 7800X3D versus DDR5-7800. Now, I do want to mention, I tried to achieve 8000, but it would seem it's not my lucky day, because I was not able to achieve 8000 in any way, shape, or form, basically getting errors and crashes within seconds. I did manage to stabilize 7800, so let's give it a shot and see how it performs. For our first game, which is Rainbow Six Siege, I do have to mention I'm going to turn some of these settings down because I'm trying to get more of a CPU bottleneck than a GPU bottleneck. This game sadly very, very well optimized. So what'll happen is that even at 1440p Ultra, we're going to be getting like 6, 700 FPS, but maybe full GPU bound, and that's not ideal. So I'm going to turn some of these settings lower, specifically to cause or induce a CPU bottleneck. So look, I'm not going to lie to you guys, I was testing to see what would make me CPU bound in the benchmark. Mind you, this is the normal Rainbow Six Siege, not the Vulcan version. I had to go down all the way to 1080p, and the lowest possible graphics to be able to become CPU bound instead of GPU bound, which I was for all of low settings at 1440p. Yeah, it's a first world problem to say the least, but we're going to be testing 1080p just for this game to get that CPU bound aspect of it going and then be able to quantify differences in RAM. Let's see what happens. And uh, I do have to say, this is a bit hilarious to watch. Seeing how we're nearly at 1200 FPS in Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p, and we're CPU bound, which is the funny thing. Yeah, it dropped all the way down to 800 there, guys. So it might not be playable at times at 800 FPS. But now that we're back up to 1100, I'm a bit happier and I can sleep at night. I'm going to wait until this ends and get back to you. <laughs> and here's the results for 6400 megahertz. Moving over to the DDR5 7800 megahertz, we might not actually be able to tell much of a difference, if at all, within this actual part of the benchmark, because the FPS is just so high. We'll have to wait for the end and see what the results say, but basically, it wouldn't make a difference for you if you had 6400 or 7800 within the Rainbow Six Siege, because yeah, the game indeed does just get too much FPS for it to matter. But it could scale in other similar games similarly, so that's where this information would be useful. Let's see the results. And I am extremely surprised to see this, but the FPS is indeed quite noticeably higher. Now, I'm not going to lie, I didn't expect the difference to be so big in a game like Rainbow Six Siege, but it really is. It seems this game likes to scale with bandwidth, which is, I'm not going to lie, very surprising, but pleasant to see. Let's move on to the next game. Okie dokie, we're over here on CS2 with 6400 megahertz RAM, and one thing I did want to mention is that the settings we're using are competitive settings at 1440p. And these are perfectly fine because we are indeed CPU bound on these settings with the 4090. The only issue with CS2 that you might notice is that the FPS varies absolutely insanely depending on where you look due to the CPU bound nature of it. So the best way to test this and compare different RAM kits and you know different CPU performance and all that stuff is to look in a singular spot without moving. So something like this, essentially. And then take our 1% lows from there, because this will mean far less FPS variance. We'll get a much more stable FPS number. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start the 1% lows, and I'm going to just look in this corner for about 10-20 seconds, and that's the FPS numbers that we're going to use. I try to do it with walking in a straight line or walking from A to B, but the bots are making things a bit difficult, as you can tell by that op shot that appeared on the wall. Anyway, I'll take that and we'll just say it was 8.9 with 240 and we'll go on to the 7800 results. And we're back on CS2 with the DDR5 7800 and what you may notice is that it yet again is consistently higher than it was on the 6400 kit. But yeah, no, uh, I'm surprised to say this, but in both Rainbow Six 
And in CS2, running the DDR5 7800 is proving to actually be beneficial on a 7800X3D. Despite it theoretically being uncoupled, which, you know, makes latency a bit rough to work with unless you're in really high frequencies, it seems to be working out. We are over here on Warzone. I'm going to begin the 1% lows and start walking this way. I like to use this route for testing because it is somewhat part of the city, allowing us to get a real representation of the FPS. And the reason I like to use Warzone is because indeed we are still GPU, I mean, sorry, CPU bound in this game. And it makes for some good RAM comparisons, assuming RAM does actually make a difference, which it does. But, you know, on X3D, it's always quite a small amount. The only issue with this game is that servers often dictate FPS. So my worry is that I'm going to get a shit server now and a better server later, and that might give us inaccurate results, but hopefully not. If it's something too outlandish, I'll be sure to let you guys know. On that note, there's a guy to my right there, so I'm going to end the recording here. <laughs> 293, 222. Jumping on DDR5 7800 within Warzone, we're going to start the 1% lows and begin running. And yet again, the trend continues because the FPS is mildly higher. What can I say? I'm impressed to see that the 7800MHz tune does make such a difference. Now you guys do need to keep in mind that the VSOC voltage is also a lot lower for the 7800 tune, which could actually be imp impacting the results a little bit because the temperature of the CPU is also lower. So here, for the 7800 tune, it's been running 1.15 VSOC. Meanwhile, on the 6400 tune, it was running 1.29 to 1.3 roughly. So that would make a difference, but yeah, 7800 proves yet again to be better. So look, I've been sat here just thinking and looking at this OC profile with the DDR5 7800 megahertz. I want to say I'm impressed that it is actually noticeably better than the 6400 megahertz profile and it just seems that games that like more bandwidth would definitely profit from this. So. Honestly, if you have a good enough motherboard, definitely give it a try with DDR5 7800 or maybe even 8000. I'm using an Asus X670 2DM motherboard, which is the Genie motherboard, and uh, it is honestly the most consistent way to run such high frequencies on AM5, but it is possible to do on other motherboards too, just a lot more difficult. Yeah, to be honest with you, there's still some merit to just getting a normal MDI kit and running it 6200 or 6400 because it's easier. But you could go down this route of overclocking heavily and getting a DDR5 7800 or 1000 kit running and seeing some performance gains, which is nice to see. Yeah, what can I tell you guys? If you have the time and patience and money, definitely consider going for something like this for AM5, but just keep in mind... You're going to need a CPU that's capable of running such frequencies and also a motherboard that's capable of running such frequencies. Not all motherboards and CPUs will be able to do this. My CPU itself couldn't even do 8000, so I got unlucky, but clearly 7800 still has some benefits. With that said, I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope it helped you make a decision on what to do in terms of RAM OC with the AM5 platform. Have a good one and enjoy.